Zoom room with uh, Ariel Gumatauta, who uh, we'll, we'll get to it. It's, it's coming up here. But first, let's go to the Guam Memorial Hospital. Right on the front lines of the war on COVID, we have hospital administrator Lillian Posadas this morning. Good morning, Lillian. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Bree. Good, Good morning, Jason. Wong. Thank you for this opportunity. Of course. We're just so uh, appreciative of the accessibility that you provide to us here on the link uh, in the name of just informing the public about uh, what's going on as much as you can. So we'll just jump right into it, Lillian. Uh, COVID numbers at the Guam Memorial Hospital. Okay. As of this morning, our COVID census is at 51. Of the 51 individuals, 11 of them are at the ICU level of care. Um, and then of the 11 that uh, require ICU level of care, um, five of them are on ventilator support. And also included in this 51 census, there are nine uh, recovering and convalescing over at the SIF facility. Have we had any um, deaths uh, since the last one that was announced? No, knock on wood, we haven't had any. So it's fine. How's, yeah. the, how's the staff holding up? Because uh, it, you know, it looks like the hospitalizations have continued uh, to decline. Are they? I mean, it's still fifth in the fifties, which is unacceptable. But are they? Is there a little bit of breathing room, maybe, Lillian? Or there is. There is uh, some breathing room, and so we're allowing some of the staff to take some, uh, you know, days off to rest and recuperate and have some time with their family. Mm. So yes, uh, we're you know, but uh, again, we're still preparing for if in case we do have that third surge or increase number of patients coming in. You know, you told us that you guys are making preparations uh, in anticipation of any, uh, you know, hospitalizations that uh, would have occurred from the big clusters and the construction companies and the Department of Corrections. Uh, did you see uh, any hospitalizations from uh, those two uh, groups? They're coming in, uh, not in large numbers that, you know, we thought we would see, but they are definitely coming in uh, needing uh, acute care. So, you know, we're, we're accommodating them and we're able to accommodate them. We, we uh, heard last there were five uh, DOC inmates uh, hospitalized over there at GMH. Has that number uh, gone up or is it still just five? No. It, ha it hasn't gone up. Um, it, it's still around five. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the blue med tents? No, they're not in the blue med tent. They're in the in the COVID care units. Uh, you know, I think either care three or care six mm -hmm. or care four, um, you know, but are depending any, on the- Are any of them receiving ICU uh, level of care? Uh, Right now, none, none are in the ICU level of care. Okay. Do you, do you, we spoke with uh, Dr. Hoa about uh, this, uh, I, I don't even, can't even pronounce the, the name. Oh, Bim, hold on. Bim no, 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 no. <laughs> the antibody, the monoclonal antibody, yeah. the Bamla. Bimab. Uh, yeah, it's Bamla. Bamla Nivimab. Bamla, Bamla Nivimab. Nivimab. Yeah. Right. Do you have any information, any new information? Are you guys going to be distributing that or is that GRMC? We, um, Guam Memorial Hospital was identified as the health facility that will receive it. And we have, we've received um, the 50 uh, vials, 50 doses that was allotted to, to Guam. And so it is in our pharmacy. The doctors, our doctors here, uh, have already pretty much, uh, you know, uh, gone through the protocol and all that uh, literature that was provided to us um, from HHS and from the Eli Lilly company. And so now they're ready to roll it out. They all uh, agree with it, and you know they're ready to administer the transfusion. So the you know individuals that come into the emergency room who meet the criteria test positive because we have to administer it to individuals who test positive within the 10 days, first 10 days, and who do not, um, you know, um, so the, who meet the criteria. So we're ready to roll it out. Mm -hmm. 
Now is yeah, but is it going to be rolled out at GMH or GRMC? We because we received the doses, but we can also share it with GRMC. Absolutely. Okay. So you know, we like to uh, let them also have some of this, so that uh, when they have individuals to come into their emergency room and they test positive and meet the criteria. Uh, you know, who are at high risk for developing uh, acuity going into that, you know, going through the, over the cliff because they have that factor that puts them at high risk, such as diabetes. Uh, that's been one of the most common factor uh, of risk, risk factor for the individuals who test positive, they really become acutely ill. So, you know, those are those are the that's the criteria for for the doctors to then administer to give the uh, banlami vimab transfusion at an outpatient uh, you know condition, so that they don't need to be uh, hospitalized you know in the hospital. Right. So they can administer it in the emergency room. Uh, administration takes about thirty minutes to forty five minutes. The individual is observed um, in the emergency room. And uh, you know, if there are any reactions, they, they will then respond accordingly. And if not, uh, no reactions within the two hours of uh, observation after it's transfused, then they are released. Mm -hmm. They still need to continue isolation because they've tested positive. Mm -hmm. Were there any um, requirements uh, that HHS um, have, have mandated uh, to GMH? Um, since we since they gave us these 50 vials do we have to do any sort of report back to them on anything we're going to monitor yeah absolutely we're going to keep track and we're going to monitor and we every day we do a minute uh enter into the hhs uh, tele-tracking portal all the data that's related to COVID. so that will be included in the daily report to hhs uh, tele-tracking so it's just added into the reports that you already uh, provide. Yeah, we are already putting it on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, because then all that data that goes into the HHS, that will determine the ongoing um, weekly sub, uh, allotment of our um, antibody, monoclonal antibody treatment. Right. Lillian, you know, with the uh, Joint Information Center releases, they, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bree, but they aren't breaking it down by clinic or by hospital anymore, right? Um, right, with yeah. their, their uh, they don't break down the information in right. terms of like the, the tests, um, Who's results, given what tests or... and who's got the positive. Right. So, so we just wanna ask, cause we don't know, have you guys had a, a large number of pos uh, people test positive at GMH? As, uh, cause I know that's the protocol when they get admitted, right? Cause we're just not seeing that well, breakdown you know from public health. Okay, let me, can I clarify that question? Sure. The number that's reported by JIC uh, is, doesn't break it down? It's just a total number. So they're like 70 positives, but you know, before it would be like, you know, 35 from DLS or, you know, 20 from GMH or, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe there was probably some confusion when they were doing it that way. And maybe they're trying to make it as clear as possible and just give it one number through the JIC, but you know, GMH and all, I guess, you know, I don't know about the other entities, but we are required yeah. um, to report on a daily basis through uh, to HHS tele-tracking. And part of it is because of the, the CARES funds that we receive. Right. So, you know, we're required to do that. So do you, do you know just offhand how many positives you guys had like this week, for example? Um, this week I can because, you know, I report also the uh, diagnostic data of uh, how many tests that we are ordered every day. And like yesterday, 39 tests were ordered uh, through our, in our facility. And of the 39 that were uh, uh, ordered, the tests were ordered, five new positive yesterday, uh, just within our own uh, organization within the hospital but collectively since we started testing in april when we got uh, first got the abbott uh, test machine collectively cumulatively uh 455 individuals tested positive from that time to wow. to yesterday hey lillian so the 39 tests that you ran uh you said yesterday right 
Yes, yes. The, tw- the 19. Is that just the regular uh, test that you run when people are admitted or they come into the emergency room? Or was it were these tests prompted by someone, you know, maybe showing symptoms with the staff? Or just, I guess, who, who took the 39 tests? Was it patients or staff? The ER. When the doctors order for a COVID test to be done, the, you know, we, get, we count that. And then also some follow-up tests of individuals who are in the hospital just to see where they are, whether yeah. they have, you know, converted to being negative. Mm. Um, or if a doctor orders a, a certain individual who's not in the COVID care unit, but perhaps manifesting some symptoms, then the doctor orders for a COVID test. So those are the different uh, scenarios mm. of how this count comes out to be 39 as of yesterday. Thank you, Lillian. Even uh, if their employees are also tested, that's included in right. this count. Yeah. And if, we'll just uh, follow up on that. Have you had any additional staff test positive for the virus since the last time we spoke? No, you know, knock on wood again. Unfortunately, we, I haven't received any report that uh, additional staff have tested. I wanted to follow up on something that William Cando had mentioned um, when we spoke with him about uh, alternate care facilities. Um, uh, one, the one in Barragata Hot. Yeah, yeah, and he said there was no contract um, uh, for uh, Catholic Social Services, right? The patients that were moved over oh. there to clear out the the SIF. Um, uh-huh. But he he wasn't able to provide like so. How much is being paid to Catholic Social Services, and is that on the on a monthly basis? Which is what? How much is being paid to Catholic Social Services? Is it on a monthly basis or? Sure. The original agreement that we drafted and we agreed, you know, both institutions. Unfortunately, the uh, AG's office did not uh, bless it. So we're going by that. Uh, original agreement of leasing that place to house the uh, skilled nursing residents on a temporary basis, $10,000 a month is what we had agreed uh, to pay them. So uh, we've made the payment. We're just now waiting for the subsequent, um, because we're making the payment through the Government uh, Claims Act process, uh, since we don't have that uh, official signed agreement by and approved by the AG's office. You know, by word, you know, by by word of honor that we agreed to, you know, to pay them, and they agreed to house our residents there on a temporary basis. That was just a really, uh, it was an urgent need for us to move them out of our acute care facility. You know, for one, they were vulnerable population, and then the second one really was to um, open up more capacity for COVID patients. Right. And so in, in, the, in the urgency of it, Catholic Social Service was so gracious to allow us to use their uh, facility. Mm-hmm. And uh, so far it's been working real well, but you know, we do want to bring those residents back into a setting that you know, um, allows for more those to be uh, placed there because right now the capacity is only 10. We can only they can only accommodate ten individuals in that facility, mm-hmm. and there are other individuals who meet the criteria for uh, you know long term care, um, but unfortunately we can't uh, place them there because there, there's only so many beds that can uh, can accommodate patients. So, so I guess uh, then if this is only temporary, are you guys where else are you looking uh, to place them, since the SIF okay. is being used for COVID patients? Right. We still want to bring them back to that facility because it is structured and it is built for long-term care residents. You know, it's got a kitchen, it's got an area for rehab. And so we want to bring them there. Uh, but first we need to separate the ventilation system because it's one whole system for the entire facility. And when you've got COVID individuals in there, you're increasing definitely the placing them to be infected to for the infection to transmission, right, of the COVID. So we wanna make sure that we separate that ventilation system first so that there's no um, chances of transmitting the COVID from one wing to the other wing where the SNU residents will be. So until we get that uh, you know, resolved, then we can then bring them over to the, uh, the SIF. Um, so it could be a while then 
Well, hopefully we're hoping to get it done. Uh, you know, there is a contractor that is uh, that we're working with to get that uh, uh, project done. Mm -hmm. What's what's the timeline? Oh gosh! Like I said yesterday, we wanted these things done last week. Yes, yes, since, since everything. Relying on expertise of the contractor. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the ten thousand uh, dollars a month. So, uh, are you guys current? We well, we are current, and we want to. However, we haven't received the the invoices from uh, Catholic Social Services. So as soon as we get it, we process the payment. Oh, so they have not been paid yet. Well, we paid, but you know, again, we're waiting for them to give us the invoice. Did, oh. did you ask about the roof? No, no, oh. still uh, trying oh. to. So okay. why did the AG's office no, uh, uh, have problems with the uh, lease agreement? Well, you know, because it was an emergency uh, uh, need for us, uh, we needed to provide all the um, discussions and all the uh, options that we explored, and we did. We provided that, but they wanted to be in more detail, uh, description, record, uh, you know, procurement record. That's what's required. And so, um, you know, we we try to we're trying to cure that and make sure that we we explored all the options, you know, like looking at the hotel, looking at another facility. Uh, it just was not at all feasible to put these residents in a hotel, uh, you know, because the bed is low. There's no place to really isolate individuals if they have to be in an isolation uh, you know, condition. Um, so the hotel was not an option. Uh, there was a, one other facility that we looked at and it was just way too small and it did not have the ability for us to like put some curtains up to make some get some privacy to the patients and so you know all those things we explored uh prior to making the decision um we just didn't uh, you know complete a procurement record mm -hmm. that was the the issue i see and so it, it got to the point where gmh uh was like, look, we, we can't um, do this. We have to move these patients out of there with or without this uh, uh, lease agreement. Agreement, yeah, right. We, we know we just need to put them in, a, in another place. And the other thing is that, you know, that facility, if we, in case we have a typhoon, we're not able to feed those individuals there because it doesn't have a, a capability uh, of preparing the meals. And if we prepare the meals here, we won't be able to deliver it there because we're in a condition, uh, typhoon condition one, and we don't want to risk, you know, the individuals, our staff uh, transporting meals over there. So, you know, for those reasons, we really need to just uh, try and get them out of that temporary facility. And that's what it was. It was just a temporary housing. Right. Have you heard those? The, are you concerned that um, the AG's office may come back and say, look, this is, uh, we already told you that you know you didn't follow or you didn't submit the proper procurement records and and yet you moved forward uh in doing this anyway well again because we're looking out uh, for what really is in the best interest for the residents and i i understand the paperwork and you know i guess if i if i didn't do the paperwork as thoroughly as possible but yet we're keeping these uh, residents safe uh, and meeting their their needs uh, in the best interest of their needs we're trying to keep uh, meet that um okay so yeah well no i mean uh, yeah i mean if we could do it for the quarantine uh hotels and the pack star and all of that then i'd I, Anyway, this you is know, it, me we're, back, we're so. just we're doing it in good faith that you know this is really what is the best uh, at the time that we made the decision. It was the best option for the residents mm -hmm. to keep right. them safe to continue the the care that they need. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, thanks, Lillian, for yeah. kind of clearing clearing that up. Can I ask about the roof? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the roof. Okay, what is it that you want to know, Chris? About the I don't know. Is it, I know it's a sunny day, but uh, you know, is it still leaking, or just a, maybe if you just a general update on the repairs and and things at the uh, Army Corps, and because uh, I remember you had mentioned it a few weeks back. 
Well, the road that still hasn't been repaired and we are still uh, going through the process. Again, it's a procurement process to get a vendor to work with us, uh, you know, what really is the most uh, cost effective to try and get that roof repaired. And yes, we want that roof repaired since yesterday, since last year, we want to get a repair, but you know, other things keep popping up, but mm -hmm. we, that, the roof, we haven't forgotten it. Uh, we are moving forward with, with the uh, procurement process for it. So the roof, the roof, the roof is not repaired. Uh, mm -hmm. Lillian, you know, we had a comment here from our friend Glenn, who's a uh, bus bearer, was hospitalized at uh, Guam Memorial Hospital. And he writes here, please tell Lillian that we had an awesome experience with care for Jason. The nurses and GMH staff were helpful. Um, where is that? Please know that you're all appreciated. Our nurses and GMH support staff are all awesome. They just work in poor conditions and work with limited resources. I blame our leaders for not fixing our local hospital. So you guys definitely do, uh, you know, what you what you got to do with the limited on, uh, resources. Hey, Lillian, about the staff, though. Uh, you know, we're bringing in these nurses. Have we brought in any additional staff or have some rotated out already with the decline in the hospitalizations? Some have had to leave for a family emergency, but uh, we have had some replacements also. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, anything else, Lillian? Continue to stay safe, wear your mask, and I know Thanksgiving is next week and everybody wants to have a, a festive celebration, but, uh, you know, we're going to have to just make some sacrifices and, you know, just make do with the limited number of people we can have in our household to enjoy the meal. But we can still enjoy the the, um, the Thanksgiving uh, holiday virtually and through electronic and through telephone communication with our family members who can't be with us. Right. But, you know, there's always that. Uh, you know, this year, but next year maybe we'll have a bigger celebration. So there's hope. Ever the optimist, Lillian. Um, on that note, because Thanksgiving is next week, I have made virtual. Um, yams with the marshmallow on top. I don't know what they call it, but it's the it's virtual. It's the yams, you know. I didn't have time to use the fresh yam, so I used the canned one. Um, but I, you Not know, the you don't have the regenerate the stuffing. I don't know. You know, that's that's a couple day process. But I just whipped it together this morning. So if you if you want to take for the staff, we have the virtual uh, candied yams. I think they call it All right. with the marshmallow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Lillian. Keep on smiling. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll okay. see you. Right. Thank you. Hey, we're gonna take a real quick uh, break. You know how to make that stuffing? No. Okay. Well, maybe Jason.